All right, good morning. Good morning. Turn it back on. <laughs> All right, so. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Slow your gum. Galatians chapter 6. Alright, starting in verse 1. Uh, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering that self, lest not also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ being uh, love one another as he has loved us. Amen. And then, um, for if a man think himself um, to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he um, have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. Verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. We can go on further, but this is um, week four in our uh, study on prayer. Now you're asking why? How does this pertain to prayer, and why? Uh, why are you reading this? Even though it's a good passage. Um, the question was asked, and I thought, okay, well, you know what? We ought to probably just cover it this week. Is that um, why would you pray corporately? In other words, why would you have group prayer? Why would you have prayer meetings, why would you have prayer with people if you can just pray alone and we're actually commanded uh, I can't really hear you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, why would you have prayer meetings, why would you have uh, group prayer, why would you have corporate prayer, why would you have prayer with people if we're commanded to just pray alone, we're commanded to go in our closet, we're commanded to just you know, pray to God in secret and he's going to reward us openly. If he can answer our prayer, um, what need is there to pray with people in a group? Like, well, what's the point? Okay. Um, there are instances where you have group prayer in the scripture, and we're going to look at some of that. Uh, but primarily, this is what I found. And that is this, that... Uh, we're to bear one another's burdens. Now in the same passage, it tells us in verse 5 that every man shall bear his own burden. So there are burdens, or there are cares, or there are necessities, or things that are needs that uh, are going to be either one of an overwhelming fashion that would require brethren to come alongside to assist, to be able to carry. And that, I believe, is what with going to people with prayer, even though God answers our prayers, or He's very capable of answering our prayer, uh, obviously if we're right with Him, if we're seeking His will, we ask in private, as He tells us, that He could reward openly. Um, if we come alongside and we help someone with bearing a burden, uh, something that would be overwhelming, then um, this would be one, in fulfillment of the law of Christ, which is to love one another as Christ has also loved us. And two, it brings glory to God. It would encourage, the, obviously, the person when God answers prayer, but then it also is a testimony to the fact of, you know, the reality of God in our life and the reality of God to be able not just, obviously, to respond to answer prayer, uh, but to go ahead and also, yes? So you would say that one of the major benefits of, of corporate prayer is is basically the threefold core kind of a principle or um, two are better than one and not only that but two can do or many can do much more than one can do so you're talking about like effectiveness like like one person can't bear the load of the things that ought to be asked God for, so more people can ask more? No. That's not always the case. In other words, 
there are some burdens in other words, that and this appears almost subjective in the fact that some burdens are greater than what I can bear that I would call assistance for but we're commanded just in verse 5 that every man should get every man's going to bear his own burden and it's go ahead well my thought on it was that then one of the one of the things that we ought to really strive for in corporate prayer is not to be repetitive yeah in other words I remember being a kid and Wednesday night Bible study would get over and then I'm like oh man they're going to pray now and what that means is like the people that are the longest winded after everybody gives after everybody gives their prayer request they're going to take turns praying for the same things and adding their angle on it basically but the first person prayed for everything and the second person prayed for everything and then the third person prayed for everything and then sometimes we'd all pray in groups after that and it was like couldn't one person say it and we say amen of course, the point isn't, hey, we don't want to talk to God. But I'm thinking from a perspective of a kid, it just made. I mean, I think sometimes a kid's perspective, oftentimes, is very insightful to how ridiculous some of the things that we do are actually are. And that's one of the things that I find. And, you know, you visit a church, and they give you a fine print, you know, four-page prayer letter of things that have been, you, you know, and then you visit the same church like three, four years later. And it's not a lot different the prayer the prayer list except for some of the people that you're praying for health needs are no longer with them, you know, or something like that. Which you know, anyway, that's that's I guess what I'm asking is, could you give us an insight on how it ought to be done? I see. Okay. All right. We'll look at that in a bit as far as practical <clears throat> suggestions. I'm just coming and introducing the fact that thematically. The only thing I, I mean, <laughs> unless anybody has some insight, and that's not to say, okay, I didn't study or anything like that. I'm just saying, if you do have insight, and so any other reason, the only thing I can see scripturally for just as a reason that stood out among the instances of where corporate prayer was. Now, granted, this is a different dispensation, so we're not Israel. You can look at Israel and then the times where they were gathered and the, they had a structure to it, and usually you would have the leadership when they were gathered, and this is primarily when they were in either a worship setting or um, things that really come to mind is particularly, which I was going to look at was in Ezra and in Nehemiah, where, well, particularly Ezra, where you have the whole congregation or the group that is remnant standing up, hearing the word of God all day, and then they basically are crying out to God uh, upon hearing the, the word of God you know, explained to them. And then they're in repentance. Now they're told to, at that point to rejoice. You know, this is a time of joy because now we've already go ahead and reestablishing the worship of God uh, back in Jerusalem. Um, but there, corporately, their structure would have been, okay, you have the leader come up, pray, and they're making a petition before God as a, as a whole, as a community, based on the fact that, hey, we've sinned against you, O oh Lord. Uh, we want to come back. We want your blessing upon us. Um, remove your hand of, I guess you could say, cursing on us and uh, restore unto us, basically, joy. Amen. Uh, and re restore unto us, uh, I guess you could say, the form of glory and our form of relationship with you. So they would have that, but New Testament, which we're going to look at, which is in Peter, uh, in Acts, actually, it's in Acts, but you have uh, instances where Peter was jailed, and then you had the church as a whole praying for him incessantly. Um, and he would be good. Uh, okay. And then he was, he was released. But I don't see, or haven't seen, or haven't found Anything. We're in Acts, or excuse me, we're in Galatians chapter 6, and we're getting ready to turn to Acts uh, chapter 12. Um, beyond this being a reason that we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, at the same time, we have a responsibility to bear our own burden. Okay, so not everything that would be brought upon me 
or that I would cons that would constitute a legitimate burden is something that I seek assistance. I mean, I seek God's assistance, obviously, because I need God's help. I need God's power. But not everything requires um, outside assistance, or meaning outside of me and the Lord. So there's a distinguishment between the burdens here. There are burdens that one would overwhelm, be overweighing, in which I would need assistance, and then there's burdens that I am to carry. Now, distinguishing or determining mm -hmm. between the two, that's a little, that's where a lot of times we get into like some confusion. And I would say, based on this, would be we can use kind of as a metric in a sense. This isn't 100%, but how you look at physical growth. Okay, say you have. I think technically it's 18 when you stop growing, as far as height-wise. No. no. I agree, like two inches or 20. What was that? Nothing. Okay. It takes you six minutes. <laughs> um, but your muscles, now granted, you can start exercising at any age, but your, your muscles will reach I wouldn't say peak. Uh, really, technically, peak is around almost thirty. Uh, but you have your you have your greatest measure of strength usually in your teens uh, to early early twenties. Um, person that isn't very say physically active during those years and hasn't developed themselves uh, in, in a physical manner to be able to say run or to be able to carry a certain amount of load of weight or to be able to uh, do some certain tasks physically will find difficulty when they do those types of uh, exercises. And I could see where somebody would be like, if they've never been accustomed to carrying heavy load, to all of a sudden have to carry mm -hmm. heavy load, that they would say, well, man, come somebody help me out, because they would be underdeveloped. But design would be, or you can say nature would be that you should be able to. You just need to develop. In other words, you should be. You should work yourself up to be able to go ahead and then, I guess you see, uh, be independent, or be to the degree where you actually can handle. Um, now that's just on a on a physical, on a physical level. But principally, I think that would apply spiritually in that. Now, granted, not everybody here is not obviously at the same level spiritually, and that's fine. I mean, that's, you grow as how not only God has led, um, but to the degree that you know God has enabled, and so um, there are spiritually things that we would maybe not be able to handle early on as a younger believer. That with development of patience and experience and an experience hope, that we would later on be able to go ahead and develop or be able to handle or be able to bear that we normally wouldn't. So, um, bearing a burden here, you have some that are a little bit overwhelming, a little bit heavier than what we would be able to handle, and then you have others that would be ones that I'm supposed to handle on my own. If it's overwhelming, obviously, with anything, you're supposed to come to God. We're told in Philippians 4 that and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then he's going to give peace in exchange because he can do something about it. And we're supposed to cast all our care on him because he's the one that's caring for us. Now granted, the main principle or the main command that we've been given is that we go to him in secret so that he can respond openly. Right? Because that's, that's how he would have. But in a corporate manner, it would be an issue of helping to bear burdens that would be overwhelming. Overwhelming to the person that hopefully were willing, they would learn, they would grow, 
so that later on they'd be able to go ahead and handle now as a burden that they bear on themselves. Uh, obviously with God. Is there any questions on that? Yes? I know a case that uh, this one fellow uh, was very crippled and had to go in a wheelchair all the time. And uh, he was a real good Christian and a real good witness. And uh, <clears throat> he didn't let that uh, bother him at all going out witnessing. I would say there that he had just uh, cast that burden on the Lord, even though he had pain and stuff. That's good. <laughs> That's actually encouraging. Uh, you have brethren like that, that uh, <clears throat> despite whatever hindrances or. Go ahead. Can we backtrack? Because I, I want to. I actually want to ask the question from when Pastor was talking okay. about how at times when we do corporate paper or prayer. Uh, we become repetitive in what we pray. Um, like we'll say, okay, we're all praying for a particular person. They'll pray something, then I'll pray something similar just from a different angle. And that would be deemed as repetitive. So I want to ask, what is vain repetition in essence, and what's just praying for something over again? You know? Um, for instance, we're still praying for a pastor for Miami Beach. Is that a situation where we should have stopped praying months ago? Or is it repetitive that I'm praying for it today and tomorrow? Or we all pray for it over and over again? Um, just what's, what's considered vain repetition in that particular regard? Because growing up, I always thought vain repetition is, dear Lord, bless this food, amen. You know, that's just something you, it's, it's you know, you say it all over again. You know, it's kind of repetitive, but I don't, I didn't it's know. different food. It's not a patty. Yeah, I, I just want to know what's considered repetition, what's vain repetition, and what's praying the same prayer again too much, if, if such is the case. Okay. He uses heathen, or the heathen, as the standard for vain repetition, because that's who he said were the ones that were guilty of that. Catholics. He said, go ahead. Catholics. Yeah, well, they're not the only ones, but yeah. yeah. That would be, if you want modern day example, um, I know which one was here. We had footage. We were in Union Station, or excuse me, yeah, Union Station down in Manhattan. And the platform, the underneath platform where we're at, second level, um, you have common open areas that you can set up and we weren't the only groups that were there at that time. So you have street musicians that go, street performers and that kind of stuff and then uh, I can't hear you. the Harry Krishnas as well that would set up over there. What they would do uh, now this would be more of an extreme but this is what this is uh, similar to the Catholics is what they think that by their much speaking. So they have a, what I guess what they call a quote unquote prayer, mm -hmm. which is this. Yeah, this is. <laughs> those are the only ones, but they had basically this formatted um, mm -hmm. set of verses that they would just literally just repeat to set themselves in a trance. Uh, the music, that, no, the droning music that went, accompanied it or whatever, I guess, can help to intensify that effect. But and then they would just sit there, like we were there, practically almost eight hours uh, of the day. And of the ones that set up, you'd say maybe I mean, they were there for like a good four or five hours, literally just doing that. They were, I mean, you had some that were walking around and trying to distribute stuff as well. But you had the bulk of the group that would just sit there playing the instruments and repeating over and over again the same amount of whatever they were saying. No sense to it. No, it's not as if you're, go ahead. I, I would just guess that the 
motivation makes the difference. In other words, if you're doing it to be seen of men, uh, it's probably vain repetition. But if God leads you to pray for a certain person or thing several times, well, I would think that was fine. Well, I got the idea that it's ill effective to be repetitive, and so I'm asking, is is it is it not effective? I mean, I mean, if we're in men's prayer group and we're all praying for the same thing, you know, that we feel led of the Lord is is not not is God going to hear our prayer or less, but is it for lack of a better phrase, ill effective? You know, is is it is it something that's because I'm just thinking of what Pastor said, you know, with the idea that sometimes we pray the same thing um, from a different angle when you use the word ridiculous. Well, I, I think don't... sometimes they don't pray from a different angle. In other words, you could say a different angle, but what I mean is just really I'm offering up. But if, if a person asks prayer, like if I ask prayer for something specifically, I don't necessarily want somebody's angle on it. Uh, but let me give you an instance. I'm going to go, I'm going to have cancer treatments, mm. right? Okay, so I'm going to have chemotherapy. Um, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to if I if I pray for that, I'm going to ask very very specifically for a couple things. You know, I might ask that you know if I'm going to wear cold compresses on my head, that my hair won't fall out. I might ask that I'll just be able to finish the thing and I'll be able to get the work done that I need to do in spite of doing it. You know, I might ask that it doesn't kill me. Whatever I ask for, um, that's what it means. You know, in other words, if I'm asking for people to pray for me, that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for people to pray that I don't. You have a person introduce. Well, pray you don't even have to have chemotherapy or pray. Whatever. Well, we're we're not. At, you know, if that's what we're asking, well, that's what we're going to ask for. So I'm not talking about disagreement in prayer. Uh, but when I grew up, it, or when I grew up in my church, a lot of times it was just a lot of scripture quotation. Dear God, we know that you tell us to ask, and if we ask it according to your will, that you'll hear us. That's what I was saying by difference in angle. In other words. Uh, a different pontification on the same thing. But a lot of times it was just really, really long-winded repetition. In other words, in other words if, if we pray and everyone says amen, that's all of us praying. That's what corporate prayer is. Corporate prayer would be where one person prays on behalf of everybody. You know, sometimes I haven't been able to say amen to us pray. You know, maybe some people pray some and think, God doesn't want that. God didn't ask for that. You know, so I don't say amen. But when I say amen, it means that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Just like when a soloist stands up and sings in church. They're not singing for their own glory. Or they're not the only one worshiping God. They're representing everybody in the body. And when they're done, you know, if we clap, we don't in our church. But if we clap, we're clapping for God. You know, which I think is a little bit of a twist. That's why we don't clap. It seems a little strange. Um, yeah, but when they're done and we say amen, what we're saying is that's exactly what I wanted to sing and that's how I wanted it sung. You know, in other words, that represents me. So the only point I was making, I wasn't really necessarily bashing uh, that people are asking from a different angle for things. That's that's like a, I guess, a, a phrase of something I said. That you could... You could Extract the phrase. My point was, five people ask for the same thing. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about repetition. Yeah. So, and, I'm, so just, I'm saying five people ask the same thing. That's repetitive. Right. You know. So now so, I'm asking, what's repetitive? I mean, I believe that many people think that for their much speaking, they'll be hurt. That's the idea. Okay. That that was what I was saying. About it. Different people could ask for the same thing. But ask it from different angles, and it would be perfectly yeah, legitimate. Angle, like, that's fine. you know, yeah. you know, praying for someone with cancer. You know, pray for someone could be praying for the family that's helping that person. Someone could be praying for, um, you know, that they would be able to get their work done or their hair. You know, there's different things that they could pray, and they wouldn't be repeating. They would be kind of in general praying for the same thing, but. Well, that would be where the advantage of the priesthood comes in. For instance, that's one of the reasons we have church business meetings. Because we have ideas of things we want to do, but we don't want to just do everything I want to do. You know, we, we ask people, please come to business meetings and give input. Like, come and, and say, you know, we, don't, we need this in our ministry, or we need whatever. 
And it may be something we're already thinking about, but when one person says, well, I could do this, or I really think we need this, then all of a sudden our eyes are open to something we hadn't considered before. It's amazing. You know, one brain can't, everything can't occur to one brain. And the same would be true in prayer as well. So, yeah, maybe God could show somebody something to pray for. Now, you're meaning just in particular with group prayer? Correct. Okay. The it seems like the cons well, not just consensus here, but I'm saying if you're going to bring petition with a group or a group, then what you're doing is basically you would have to have had agreement to okay, what this is what we're praying. I don't know if I'm making sense here. Now it's like when you're asking a representative on behalf of a group to do something, it's say this. Because you can either best articulate what it is that we want to communicate to the person that you're going to communicate to. Right? So he's going to say what he's going to say, and you just basically end up having to sit back and be like, okay, well, you know. Otherwise, it's like, well, why do you ask? Why don't you just go to your, you know. Okay. So with a group, when you're bringing, as far as that's concerned, you know, you're asking, you're requesting for the person going on behalf of the person representing the group to basically ask for this thing in particular, the specific. Um, when we, well, when we do it, we don't really have the format. In other words, it's just when we do men's prayer, we're not, in other words, we didn't ask anybody to pray on it. Does, does that make sense? Because we're not, we're not even taking requests. So all we did was just come in and pray. So, we almost Whatever's always pray for different things. It's, it's very, very rarely, very rarely when we pray, do we ever pray for the same thing. That's true. Yeah. So the thing is, it's not. It's not as if you're coming and requesting on behalf. You see, sometimes the format is different. So that, that really would is a help too, because it, actually, when we get together and pray, what the other men pray for, God oftentimes puts that in my heart, and then I, you know, I kind of see, well, you know, I need to be praying for that. I need to ask for that. So that's. Yeah. Okay. Does that clarify? No. For the most part. All right. The vain repetition would come in, in part, say, well, it uses the group setting. Okay, you're asking on behalf of the group, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the person speaking, you're making requests, and so that's what it should be. You're making a request. Um, I found myself doing this a lot early on when I was first saved. I just didn't know better. Nobody had really kind of taught me. But the thing is, it's if you're in a group, speak, you know, praying on behalf aloud. A lot of times, you end up doing, I guess, for the benefit of the hearer, or you're almost like you're trying to communicate something to the hearer rather than you're actually trying to do on behalf <laughs> of the hearer. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you don't want to do that. You want to when you when you're praying, you're praying to God, so you're communicating to God. You're just bringing before him what it is that's on your heart or what it is that you've been asked to bring forth. Go ahead. Does musical accompaniment help though? For prayer? Public prayer? <laughs> you ever see like when, when some, uh, churches do that. some church like somebody's praying and they got somebody in the background softly playing the piano you know, and, uh -huh. and then they you know like they have a really well developed music program you know, they don't even pray without music. No, I don't see yeah, the invitation. A lot of invitations. Yeah. That, that's yeah. yeah, the invitation. I see that. I've seen that in invitations. I've never seen that like just as a part of a prayer. Yeah. Prayer, uh, but I do have seen it as far as invitations. But anyways, when you're coming before you bring on behalf of a group, or you're praying on behalf of a group, then it's you're coming to God. You're you're talking to God. So it's they're just listening in. In other words, you're not. Trying to <laughs> trying to instruct them or educate them on whatever it is that you know your pet peeve is or whatever it is that is weighing on or whatever you feel like you need to be able to communicate to them. In other words, you, your focus should be on the fact that they're just listening in. They're just here joining with you. On the fact that you're you're coming to him. So as far as the repetition on that part, usually with a group, 
it should have been already communicated as far as, okay, this is what we've been asked. And so then the representative is, okay, God, you know, here, I don't have insight on it. In other words, a lot of times if I'm asked something that I have no insight on, it's just, um, okay. If it's something that I'm asked that counters or is contrary to what I would know from Scripture, then I'm going to either one, I got to pray for it, or I'm two, I'm just going to pray against or just for enlightenment as far as for the person that asked. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Now, with, again, with our group, that formatting, no one's asked anything as far as, because we, we just come in and we just pray. So that wouldn't constitute a repetition. Right. Do you need any more clarification or is there anything? Oh, no. I think I've got it for the most part. Okay. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Okay. I have much more time for, for this. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand, or his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Uh, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four uh, quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the doors, or excuse me, before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Amen. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And, the, and saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he was, but, excuse me, thought he saw a vision. Uh, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, or excuse me, unto the city, which opened to them of his, of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through, this, through one street, and forthwith uh, the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named uh, Rhoda. Uh, and when she knew Peter's <coughs> voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she con constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And then he's gonna he's gonna go further down and he's gonna tell them about what happened. Alright, so we have here verse five, where it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And then when he came to Mary's house, it says that uh, many were gathered <laughs> together praying. Praying it doesn't say exclusively that they were praying for him, but it seems as if they were praying for him, just context-wise, even though it's not explicitly stated um, because of the fact that, uh, which surprisingly, they were astonished. All right, so this is one instance of many of group prayer, prayer <coughs> meeting. You have a prayer group, you have a group of people that are gathered together, and particularly here it says of the church, of the church here, they hear of Peter being taken to prison. John's already been, or excuse me, James has been killed uh, by Herod. And now there are other leadership in the church, but this would be primary leadership. It'd be somebody like taking pastor away. Okay, so if they kill, 
<laughs> they killed me. <laughs> Not that we wouldn't want you dead or anything, but the same. Okay, they kill me, and then they take faster away. So they take faster. He's in prison. And so we were like, man, what do we do? Um, so well, they know they do. They get together and they are in group praying on the behalf of Peter, saying, "God, let him free. God, release him. Don't kill him. God, we want him alive." We want him back to be able to go ahead and uh, minister to us. So it says that they were without ceasing, and then they were still gathered together, whatever amount of time that had been from whenever he was taken to the time that he was released in groups praying, or as a group praying. Uh, that's not to say that they would have spent their 24-7 at that house, they could have done it in any number of practical ways to go ahead and uh, and have prayed. You know, if they had jobs, I was certain that they would have gone out and they would have handled their responsibilities and come back whenever they had their free time, go back to, to pray. But here they have the group praying with what constitutes a genuine need. Okay, you have the apostle, foundational member of the church. He's one of the ones that God is using to be able to establish not just the church, but also to establish the doctrine and teaching of what we're to learn as a church, what's to be passed down, what we're entrusted with, with as far as uh, all things that have been co commanded us by Jesus to be able to teach unto others, that they may also teach others also. So Peter here in prison, good possibility that he might be put to death because right? there's no you know you don't know but that's what they're thinking so they come together and they say we need to pray right. now how do you think they did that intent intent Ser serious intent yeah You think you had just one person of however many were gathered there? Say, say you have like 20 people. I'm just giving a rough estimate. I don't know how many people are there. There's no number given. Say you have like 20 people that are gathered there. All right. It says of them that they prayed incessantly or without ceasing. And then they had also uh, many that were gathered there praying. So you, you would have one. It says they were all praying for him. Okay, my, my question is, why without ceasing? Because <laughs> they hadn't got an answer yet and they needed one. Things are very serious. Easter came, he was dead. John and James are Okay. I've done it like Peter more than John and James. Or James. And then when they got... Their response, it would have been when they saw Peter at the gate. Yeah. And it says of which they were astonished. So they didn't, they didn't actually believe God's response initially. They had heard from the young girl, and they first thought, no, that you're, you're mad, you're crazy. And they said to her, it is this ghost that you see. Um, based on those responses, mind you, this is a little conjecture, not explicitly stated. How believing were they in their prayer? They were a little bit pagan. <laughs> do, do we really know that they were praying for his release? Yeah. It's assumed. Only. Well, it says that that, that uh, Herod was going to bring him before the people at Easter. So if they're praying for him, they. It's assumed, but um, they could have been praying for Herod's judgment to not be uh, death sentence. Yeah, they weren't. I, I, we don't know that they were praying that Peter would be released tonight. 
no. from prison by an angel, you know, surely not to the extent that it happened. No. My, I conjecture that they would have been praying for his release, or at least some of them, on the basis of God's response mm -hmm. to the fact that they were praying. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not explicitly told what they prayed for, but the manner in which God answered. Uh, now, I don't think they would have... I don't personally think, I mean, I could be wrong, I could stand to be corrected, that they would have had anybody in particular pray, okay, Lord, send an angel, and, and in the manner in which he answered, but the fact that he was released, to me, tells me somebody was praying for his release, because God decided to respond in that manner to it. So, so you would say at least some of them had a lack of belief in, in that it would happen, that he would be released? Oh, yes. I think the strength of their faith was they believed enough to ask. In other words, I have many times the, the most we could do is just say, God, please do something I, that I can't even believe you could do. But God, God, when God answers prayer, He does miracles. Here's the thing. It only takes the faith of the greater than a mustard seed. Which is not well, I'll bring up the night. <laughs> I actually bought some. Uh, You're not going to bring him tonight? Are they in your car? No. You yeah, have somebody going to my house. So yeah. We'll be able to bring him for me tonight. Oh. That's right. <laughs> um, but you, you're going to see they're not very big. right? And it's not just a mustard seed itself, but it's a grain of a mustard seed that we're looking at. And so the thing is, it doesn't take very much faith for God to respond, but faith is a necessary element for God to respond. God. I've heard uh, people say that they uh, had very little faith, but I don't believe that's so. They just uh, they didn't know when God was going to do it, and they couldn't be believing that God would answer their prayer. Yeah, you need not everybody. People are going to waver. That's not to excuse wavering. Because uh, we should, because unbelief displeases God. But the fact is, He's able to strengthen us, and He is able to help our unbelief that we would remain faithful. Um, now, the point with bringing this up is they prayed incessantly, God answered their prayer, um, and you have an actual legitimate need that was brought forth. and. Here is a group, whether they were all gathered in the same house, because you had a portion that were gathered within that house, or they were all the church as a whole, individually within their own homes, praying, but the church as a whole was praying. And it would seem as if the whole were praying for the same thing. Well, I can't say that. They were praying for God to work on the behalf of Peter. Whether it was some that were praying, God give boldness, that he may face death, and be a better testimony because that is something that we do see that the believers did pray for boldness in the light of persecution which normally we would think that you would ask for deliverance um, but most of them or the majority of the church actually ended up praying for boldness uh, not necessarily deliverance go ahead yes yes sir uh, <coughs> I believe that God answers according to His will, not necessarily according to our will. In other words, uh, we may pray for something uh, that it's not God's will, and uh, He may give us something else. In other words, you might be praying that you're going to marry this girl, and God has this other girl that <laughs> you're going to marry her. Well, yeah, that's where you align your heart at the beginning whenever you go to the beginning. The request that you, as as well as Jesus told at the beginning, well at the beginning of our even um, our whole series that not my will but thine be done. You know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where you're aligning your heart so that you are asking, you're requesting things that God wants rather than just you asking amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Because in the end, really, that's what it comes down to as far as when you ask. Um, that not according to God's will, it's something that you either 
something that is not aligned with his teaching. Uh, quite often it's for us to consume our own lust, but maybe not in every case. It's just something that counters his, who, he, who he is as a person, his character. But that's at the beginning. You actually seek his will, you seek his heart on the matter so that you can pray in line with his will so that your will is his. Your will is, he inputs his will into you that you're asking his will on the matter. All right. Uh, conclusion. Corporate prayer. It is valid. We see it in scripture. Uh, to some principles that should guide our prayer. Obviously not be repetitious. It should be vain. Uh, should be obviously aligned with the will of God um, as with private prayer. The uh, difference is that you have a person, a representative, speaking on the behalf of the group, making requests to God on behalf of a group. Uh, so obviously there should be a measure of unity there. And then um, should be in faith. Yes? I think it's important, too, to qualify that, that nothing's forbidden as far as corporate prayer goes. In other words, we're not to do it to be seen of men. But if a group prays a certain way, and maybe they've fallen into the custom of this is how we pray, it's sort of like forbidding somebody to be northern or southern or midwestern. Or, you know, in other words, some things culturally that we do are stupid. But you're not wrong. You know, so coming up with your own vowel pronunciations like the southerners do, they do it. And you know what? I don't think they're going to fall under judgment for it. It just doesn't make any sense. And I think it's important to understand the spirit when you say, well, you know, in our church, we're not going to do this. We're going to do it. If, if there isn't a critical spirit about it. There isn't a well, other people are doing this and this and this and this. The fact of the matter is, is that the very things that agitate me bring great comfort to other people, you know. And um, things that I see as pointless or unnecessary, the different personalities may be a real help. Does anybody have any questions? All right, no questions. Uh, next week, imprecatory prayer, that'll finish off the series. So the imprecatory, again, that's when you're praying basically God's judgment on somebody. Or, <laughs> so I like to say you get mad, and then you want to you curse them on the behalf of the Lord. But, uh, anyway, so no, no questions. Imprecatory prayer next week, and we're dismissed. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. I thank you. That was fun. Test, test, check, check. Yeah, this one's all messed up, Huh? Test, test, test. Whatever in the world happened to this one? There we go.